Another major modification fitted to new F-111s is PaveTac, a self-contained standoff weapons delivery system. PaveTac uses an infrared TV camera coupled to a laser rangefinder designator to place guided bombs or missiles on target. PaveTac components are fitted throughout the aircraft, but its major component is the PaveTac pod, which is fitted on a rotating cradle in the bomb bay. The pod is retracted into the bay when not in use. The PaveTac pod is equipped with electro-optical sensors, infrared TV camera, and laser. Its movable pod head provides complete coverage beneath the aircraft. Targets are tracked on radar and steering corrections are made. At a distance of approximately three miles, the target is identified on the TV display and the infrared imagery is switched on. The video picture permits extremely accurate target tracking. The laser-guided bomb is released. And the aircraft turns away to avoid the bomb blast and anti-aircraft fire. The forward-looking infrared continues to track the target and point the laser. Five seconds before impact, the laser is activated to guide the weapon. This is an actual AGM Maverick missile launch. The missile crosshairs are placed on the target by the weapon systems operator. The missile is now locked on target. The missile has launched, the TV video will disappear and the PaveTax infrared video will be used to aim, track and determine the success of the strike. The difficulties of flying the uh, F-111 are primarily uh, in the night regime or in the, in the bad weather. And that's where we, we're really uh, kind of a king of the hill in terms of uh, abilities in the world. Uh, the 111 was designed to operate at night in bad weather at very low altitudes. And uh, coupled with that, my job is to uh, look at a radar set and to uh, constantly determine our position and make sure that we're uh, going exactly where we want to and that our uh, navigation and bombing system is really accurate and that enables us to uh, deliver the weapons to drop the bombs on target so it's a very difficult part of my job to constantly be evaluating the airplane's position and how good the navigation system is the objective of of the uh, strike was to uh, take some airplanes that could go a long ways carry a lot of a lot of bombs and could precisely hit targets uh, in, in any kind of weather and take off and refuel and, and get there in any kind of weather and uh, hit targets that were very close to uh, areas where you, you just wouldn't want to put bombs. So that was our mission. And as a wing, we all pitched in and, and uh, contributed. April 14, 1986. F-111s of the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing leave RAF Lakenheath as part of the American strike mission against Libya. In response to a wave of Libyan-sponsored terrorist acts, the United States will strike five targets. Colonel Paul Fazakerly, a member of the 48th Fighter Wing, explains. The Navy's very capable of doing this kind of a mission, and they could drive carriers up there, and that's why we, we buy aircraft carriers, project power and, and drop bombs. But in this particular case, we had uh, five targets that we wanted to take out pretty much simultaneously. The, the Benita and Baghazi were the airfields to the east of, of the uh, Gulf of Sidra. And then we had 
three targets in the Tripoli area, the downtown headquarters complex, the swimming pool, which is an underwater demolition team uh, headquarters, and a, and a um, frogman type uh, training center, as well as the third target, which was their airfield that they used to use their IL-76 transport aircraft to, to transport the, uh, their, their terrorist uh, activities or to use the sports terrorist activities. So with five targets and, and the amount of defenses that were right around the Tripoli airport uh, and uh, the town itself, uh, it, it became an atmosphere where using the A6 off of a carrier, it's a little bit slower, it flies a little bit higher, it doesn't, doesn't have quite the capability to hit the targets as well as the F-111. It was decided at, at, the, at the 11th hour that it would be better if this would be a joint mission since we had practiced that contingency option. And so they decided, to, you know, the National Command Authority decided to go ahead with that plan as a joint option and, and the 111 would be, be best suited for going into the area that was the, the most heavily defended. And it could survive much better than, and hit the targets with, with minimum collateral damage where the A6 would have a, I think a problem in that area uh, without an enormous amount of, of support. So the Air Force picked up the western targets, uh, which were in downtown Tripoli area, and the Navy picked up the two airfields to the east. And it worked very good because we had trained with the Navy. We had a Navy liaison officer in the squadron, and everyone was comfortable with uh, the geographical separation of, of the two services, and yet working together, sharing a lot of mutual supports. In the 48th wing at Lake and Heath, uh, we took off from home and flew over 14 hours. It was just about 14 hours and 10 minutes was the longest mission. And refueled uh, three or four times, maybe even as much as five, because we wanted to, to optimize our refueling on the way down to be as close to uh, full tanks just prior to drop off in, down in, uh, in, in the Ita Italian area. Uh, there was no problem staying awake and being alive and, and on, the, on the way down as far as the crews commented. Uh, we had a, a little bit of problems with airplanes because the F-111 is, is typically uh, a two and a half hour mission airplane. Uh, when you fly it for five, six hours and then go hit a target, uh, you know, who knows what's going to be left of it. You know, so even though we had tracked the airplane's maintenance capability, it was really gutsy to, to take an old airplane like that that far and then expect it to perform. So of the 24 airplanes that we had started with, we took 18 down there, and then of the 18, we had actually 11 go into the target area. So we did have some, some maintenance problems, and we, we fully expected to with uh, taking an older airplane that far. And we had very, very strict rules of engagement because we didn't want to to throw bombs off into the middle of the town. And this is the, the route that uh, was, was flown. That's a picture of the attack radar. And the attack radar on an F-111, which you see there, uh, exercise and train following radar is the key to, to a train avoidance. The paved tack pod rotates out of the bay, as you see in this picture. And the whole bay rotates in order to have your laser capability to spot a target. That's the laser picture, the forward-looking infrared radar. The airplane tosses the bombs and then turns in a 135 degree wing over move, puts the crosshairs right on the target. Now you see the target there is the headquarters complex. Uh, to the right and off to the bottom of the screen is the tent, which was not a target. Most folks uh, think that that was the target. But the crosshairs are exactly right on the point where they should be, and the laser will be turned on at the last eight seconds of the, of the flight of the bomb, and the bomb will come in from above and destroy the target. In this particular case, the bombs uh, landed right at the front door and skipped into the, into the uh, headquarters. There was some good BBC footage that showed uh, it all pretty much gutted out the next day. There's a, a clip of uh, ZSU-23-4 and just different kinds of uh, artillery. There was a lot of artillery barrages and flares fired off. The flares were the uh, thing that was uh, most disheartening, really, from a standpoint of a guy that wants to go down and fly at night and not see anything like that. They, they uh, distract you quite a bit. The other target that you're going to look at here is the airfield. The airplane is turning to the right because there was a little bit of a, an error in the radar offsets, but now the forward-looking radar has got it on a paved tack. 
the bombs are gone. And you see of the 